He wants to contact the pilot of that aircraft and say, I know your operation was previously approved, but please, really, you need to you need to get away from my firefighters now. I understand that part, but the, the, the communication from one UAS to the pilot of another UAS. Okay. Yeah, I thought in, you were talking about that, and, and that's something that, apart from something like TCAS, um, I I'm, I'm, I'm cannot imagine yet. Well, so um, the, the straightforward one is two aircraft, neither of which is TCAS equipped because they're both small UAS that aren't required to be TCAS equipped. And, you know, uh, you know, one drone operator sees another drone and they just want to coordinate so that they will, you know, stay out of each other's hair. So this what would be less about safety, but about uh, mission completion. So I want to make this great video shot of something and another drone is flying into uh, my my scene. Yeah, it, it could be either, uh, but presumably the safety implications of two small unmanned aircraft in the, in the same airspace are, are minor to begin with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just one one I would I would say more administrative comment here is that I'm not sure that the um, I would say the current um, communication interface is the is within the current I would say charter we have for the working group. So it should be I would say yeah to, to, to we need to double check if that I would say that interface is currently a part of what we have already in the um, in the, uh, the charter. If it is not, I'm not sure that we uh, we can uh, spend more time on that. Uh, at least for um, in the uh, in the early um, phase of the uh, of the working group, um, we won't. I would say we won't specify that in the phase why it is needed and so on because this is not what in in the uh, in the current charter. But but perhaps I'm I'm wrong. But we need to double check that one. Um, still. So agree with you there, and and I'm not suggesting that it would be appropriate for us to work on the actual observer to pilot communications channel. Uh, I'm merely suggesting that we want to ensure that our requirements are such that the uh, identifier that we use is one that can enable such contact to be initiated uh, using internet protocol based higher layer protocols, whatever they might be, SIP or whatever. Yes, next slide. So these are news items, and some of them perhaps were not new to everyone, but they were new to me. Um, in the US, the FAA is part of the Department of Transportation. And uh, back in April, but it, I only learned of it a couple of weeks ago, um, they released a position paper, kind of just a set of slides entitled Blockchain for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. And it has a chapter three that would only take anybody five minutes to read and digest, and that might be worth doing. Um, of greater interest, the FAA also released um, around April 1st with a deadline of uh, the end of April or something like that, uh, an RFI that I didn't see until too late to respond entitled Low Altitude Manned Aviator Participation in Remote ID. And this was the idea that although it has been made clear that when manned and unmanned aircraft are operating in the same airspace, it is the responsibility of the operator of the unmanned aircraft to be aware of the manned aircraft and stay out of their way, the manned aircraft take priority, Nonetheless, some general aviation uh, pilots may want the additional situational awareness that is provided by being able to uh, receive uh, UAS remote ID. I don't think there's really any thought of sending UAS remote ID as if they were an unmanned aircraft when in fact they're manned, but just wanting to be able to receive it while on board their, you know, their small aircraft and, and know what's going on around in the airspace. Um, then, interestingly, uh, several cabinet level agencies in the US are pushing back against the FAA and PRM. And I'm not at liberty to disclose the details, but one major agency went so far as to go through 
some of the 50,000 plus comments that the FAA received and call out comments, many of them negative on the FAA's proposed rules and and um, put together a, a response to the FAA that said, hey, look at all these comments that don't like this particular aspect of your rules. And we as you know, federal agency XYZ also don't like that uh, rule. And I just wanted to make the point that many of the public comments um, that this agency is supporting in their response to the FAA uh, are the same comments that we made about this information cannot be trusted and no one can use it to take um, immediate action if they might need to. Also, uh, ASTM has released uh, version 0 0.1 of their draft standard on UAS traffic management. They haven't released it publicly. They have merely circulated it within that working group. And this matters in that UTM and RID were originally contemplated as two separate undertakings. But over the course of the past year, everyone has woken up and realized that no, you can't really do UTM without remote ID. Remote ID is the major source of situational awareness in real time within uh, UTM. Um, the European Aviation Safety Agency released uh, terms of reference on their rulemaking task 230 um, just uh, three weeks ago now. Um, it is very broad in scope. It is not just about remote ID. It's not even focused on remote ID. It's a broad regulatory framework on how UAS are gonna fit into the European aviation system, um, what's being called uh, U space, which is more uh, ambitious than what the FAA is calling UTM, because it really does envision cohabiting of manned and unmanned aircraft in the same volumes. And then finally, um, EuroK has released a minimum operational performance standard for what they're calling UAS electronic identification. And this is being circulated for what they call consultation to be complete by the 5th of August. What's interesting about this is that the aviation community talks about safety standards and security standards. And they regard safety standards as uh, needing to meet a higher bar than security standards. And the so-called direct remote identification um, that we have um, cited in our requirements document was for security, whereas this new thing, uh, which is written, you know, cognizant of the earlier one, but with a different focus, um, we, we need to look at that and and see what the, the safety oriented um, EID is uh, mandating in Europe. And of course, UA, you're okay, doesn't get the mandate, they get to come up with stuff which the EASA or the individual member states might mandate. So anybody want to talk about any of these things before we move on? I guess let's move on. Um, um, I, this is Bob. I'll just add that I, I did send an email that also another one is the ANSI um, Unmanned Aircraft Standards um, Roadmap, which was finalized and our work is in there. Um, we are, IETF is now listed as one of the SDOs in this space. Uh, and this is scheduled to be published end of the month. And as soon as the public um, URL is available, I will share it with everybody. Maybe one question. Maybe I have one question regarding the FAA RFI. Um, I'm just wondering how how it it has impacted um, our requirements. If it has ever impacted those, it has not reflected anything that we have um, captured in writing yet. I guess I just wanted everyone to be aware that people are now thinking about this, and so this is this is a kind of an incremental encroachment on things that were previously being treated by the aviation community as out of bounds. Um, the aviation community was looking at manned and unmanned as largely being segregated into different airspaces. And so there would be no reason that a human pilot on a manned aircraft would have any reason 
uh, to to um, to want to know what was going on with uh, UAS. And now they're saying, well, maybe not so fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stu, this is to say, uh, regarding the FE uh, RFI, my personal opinion is I don't think this is going to have a huge impact for us. Uh, since uh, this uh, UES mostly flying under 400 feet, which is uh, in the United States would be class golf, which is uncontrolled airspace. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, ATC might not have any authority in this airspace. Uh, you know, that might leave the main aircraft, uh, you know, uh, aware of what happened in this area, which is not a control. Just personal opinion on that. Yes, uh, it, it it appears from the RFI's uh, contextual introduction text that they were really contemplating so-called general aviation aircraft, you know, barnstormer pilots like my grandfather, who, you know, may actually operate at altitudes much lower than obviously an airliner does, except when, you know, landing or taking off. Anyway, I guess the real point would be that um, this drives the safety issue even harder. If if uh, if manned uh, aircraft are going to be cohabiting in the same low altitude uh, airspaces and wanting to be aware of the unmanned aircraft around them and depending upon UAS remote ID to tell them, um, then you know that that pushes the the requirements buyer higher on reliability and and other concerns like that for for us remote id okay, I think we can move to the next slide all right so the first thing i want to say before getting into this slide is i am the problem and i know it um, in the past month, uh, evangelism of what we are doing overwhelmed uh, editing our actual drafts. So um, what, what we did get done, um, Andre provided uh, some text entitled Architectural Implications of EASA Requirements, and that had to do with the fundamental conflict um, between uh, privacy and things that are being mandated effective oh a week from today uh, in Europe, and um, more generally uh, the conflict between privacy and transparency. I think some people have have um, framed this as a conflict between privacy and safety, and I, I really don't see it that way. Um, it's a conflict between privacy and transparency, as. Um, I think Tearless uh, and uh, and Stuart from Apple pointed out um, back in uh, either Montreal or Singapore, I forget which, um, because there's no there's no question about the public being able to see the identifier. The public needs to see the identifier so that if the aircraft is doing something that the observer in the general public thinks is not a good idea, the member of the general public can constitute authorities and those authorities can then track that identifier back to the operator and have a conversation with them. The question is, should the public have transparency into things beyond the identifier itself? Um, and then those things beyond the identifier itself that in many cases will be looked up in a registry clearly authority needs to have access to those and presumably it is authorities that are primarily um worried about the the safety aspects anyway next bullet um as bob mentioned uh he became very actively involved in the ANSI uas standardization collaboratives effort to produce a roadmap now this thing is like two or three hundred pages long and it had um a major section that was all the other SDOs that are involved in setting any kind of standards related to UAS. And um, ASTM was in there. Uh, lots of organizations were in there. IETF was completely absent. And so I want to thank um, our chairs and our area director and Bob for fixing that. Um, then Adam 
um, has made some progress with prototypes. Um, he has uh, registration operations so that uh, a new operator can get into a registry. Uh, an operator who's already in a registry can register a new aircraft. Um, the operator and the aircraft can have certificates issued uh, by the registry and can have uh, HIP resource records placed in DNS uh, automatically by the registry. And then those HIP resource records can be uh, looked up um, upon receiving a broadcast remote ID transmission so that signatures can be verified or alternatively, if somebody just waits long enough for a periodic broadcast of one of these highly compact certificates, then recourse to DNS is not required and the uh, public key is available from the certificate to be used to uh, verify the signatures on the other messages. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll have a few minutes today for um, Bob and Adam um, and Andre to talk about those three contributions that they have made. The registration operations workshop, we were invited to present. We did present. We took advantage of the opportunity as a plea to them for help with registration issues. Unfortunately, some of the early speakers went way over time and I was the last speaker and I had to cover, you know, 20 minutes worth of material in 10 minutes. Um, but hopefully we will get some help there. We, we've had at least one company that sells technology to registry operators that has been very active in contacting Bob and me since about what we could do together. Um, the last thing which has basically utterly consumed me and largely consumed Bob is uh, ICAO has welcomed us into their trust framework study group, which has three subordinate working groups. We've been very active in their grain, which is not about setting standards. It's about building a network. And you'll notice that I said an internet, lowercase, for aviation ecosystem. By aviation ecosystem, I don't mean just aircraft. I mean aircraft and ground operations that support anything to do with aviation. Um, and what they're envisioning is a walled garden that will use the internet protocol suite and that will have uh, gateways back and forth to the internet, but those gateways will be very tightly locked down. Now we've all you know, heard that story before and we know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but anyway, that's their vision is uh, a walled garden, separate internet for the aviation ecosystem. Then there's a group called the Trust Reciprocity Operational Needs. They're identifying use cases and deriving from those use cases requirements, which they're feeding to the other two working groups, Grain and the Digital Identity Working Group. The Digital Identity Working Group is um, focused basically on X.509 certificates um, for the aviation business. Um, but in the Tron working group, um, what was brought up several weeks ago is the idea that it would be really great if we had a harmonized standard identifier for all aircraft, whether they're balloons or unmanned aircraft systems or manned aircraft, small or large, whatever, a standard identifier. And that does not exist today, surprisingly. And um, even to the extent that, you know, tail numbers painted on planes do exist, that doesn't help you if you want to do anything with digital twins um, in, in the network space. So they want a standard identifier that straddles from physical space to virtual space. And so we're, we're participating in that. Okay, what's our backlog? We need to harmonize the requirements terminology with ICAO. Um, I believe, I don't know if uh, Saulo is on today, but uh, Saulo um, da Silva, um, who's um, very prominent in ICAO, has provided me with um, the definitive uh, definitions, um, that was redundant, sorry, um, that we can stick into our requirements draft. Um, and then inputs. Uh, I spent several days marshalling inputs from a lot of sources. That's kind of my writing process is get all the inputs all marshaled and then go through them as like a checklist and one by one put them into the drafts. Well, unfortunately, after I had marshaled all of my inputs, something blew up in my personal life and I had to suspend. And so this has not gone into the drafts, but they're all marshaled. And so I can put them in the drafts along with any further inputs that additional reviewers provide. Um, I've basically got like 50 emails that I would categorize as inputs, specific questions, specific comments, 
uh, specific issues raised that need to be um, in the drafts. Um, and that's, you know, down selected from a much larger number of drip related emails. But I do want to uh, emphasize what the co chair said at the beginning. Although Bob and I have had lots of off list interactions, uh, the TM RID mailing list has been extremely quiet, which is not helpful. Um, who wants to talk about any of this before we move on? Just to note that uh, ESA seems to postpone drone ID enforcement till end of this year due to Corona. I guess that's good news. <laughs> Did you want to comment on it further? Well, maybe they have more time to consider more privacy uh, relevant solution from ITF. Great. Okay, so I really only have um Stuart, this is Sue. When will you have time to um do this update? Should we wait for the update to do our reviews or should we do the reviews on what you have and then um give you the next round after you do the next uh update? How do you want to handle that? Um from anybody who hasn't already uh, done a review of what's out there, um, I prefer it if you took a look at what's out there and, you know, send me what you have to say as soon as possible so that I can uh, reflect it. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a couple of reviewers who have a chance to take another look at it um, just prior to uh, when we were supposed to be in Madrid. Okay. As far as when I have time, um, I have time now. Um, Dad survived his um, stroke, and I took him home last night, and so I'm I'm uh, I'm back back in the saddle. So the th the main issue that I'd like to to get into is this whole you know privacy versus transparency thing, and there was one particular requirement that uh, a lot of people uh, in our um, meeting in uh, Singapore. Uh, or in our subsequent interims um, have, have grumbled about a little bit. And this was uh, privacy three, encrypted storage. Now, let me tell you what the motivator for this is. Um, we've all had the experience of going to some bank's website and receiving uh, in our web browser windows all kinds of assurance that our privacy is being protected. And of course, it's nonsense. What that means is they're running TLS, so great, um, you know, we know that the server really is who the server claims to be, and our data is uh, encrypted while in transit. But as soon as it gets to the other end, they put it on a hard drive that you know um, the janitor has access to, and uh, we're all you know we're all unhappy with this. And so I wrote this requirement that said Drip should enable selective strong encryption of private data at rest in such a manner that only authorized actors can recover it. But that gets a little outside the IETF's normal swim lane, as a number of people have pointed out. So the question is, do we keep this requirement as written above? Do we simply delete it or do we rewrite it in some manner that um, makes clear that we are not trying to get into the business of information security on end systems, but that we are wanting to ensure that the protocols that are used when those end systems communicate with each other are fully compatible with and supportive of and indeed encourage information security on those end systems. And I will sit back and, and um, I think this would be a good place for some fur to fly. Stu, Bob here. So do you share the NS, um, the NASA um, USS, inter-USS um, document that touches on some of these areas? I had not shared it. Um, do you have it handy? Um, I have my copy. I can send it to the list, but that's kind of hard. We large. Do we have a URL for it? I'll look. Um, most of that stuff um, they tend to keep on portals that they, um, you know, that they limit access to. But I will inquire whether there is a a, a public URL that everybody can go to for it. I put it on my own server and 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 post that URL. It is a public document. I'll get. I'll do that after this call. 
so that people can then uh, um, look at that. Um, for, for the rest of you, um, NASA put out a very extensive document for inter-USS communications, um, which is pretty much outside of the DRIP framework, but deals a lot with uh, various protocols and certificates in the IETF arena and how communication between um, members of the total ecosystem would communicate and thus hopefully protect this um, 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 UAS information. So I'll make it available, I hope you can read it and can uh, dwell on its content to see how it may factor into our work. Anyway, that is my last slide and beyond any discussion of this, which uh, I, I hope we'll have. Um, I tried to put myself in the queue uh, in the chat um, on encrypted storage, uh, you could shift it from um, a firm requirement into a security considerations section towards the end of the document. And that would allow you to caution that storage could still be um, present privacy implications uh, without putting in the requirement in an IETF document that goes slightly beyond what the IETF normally does. Uh, so that would be if you wanted to highlight it without um, actually going beyond the remit of what the IETF does, but I can put such things in my review also now that you've highlighted them here, so. Uh, I have another question for you, Stuart. This is Emilia, by the way. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself. This is this is Sue Hairs again. Thank you for that excellent comment about putting things in the uh, security section. One other way to be proactive that I found uh, useful in my own uh, working groups is um, you might dash off a little note to uh, the security ADs and say, look, we've got this particular issue. Here's our concept. Uh, can you give some advice? And they're usually very helpful to work early in the process. So that would keep you in the conversation with the ITF folks. Then if you want to put it in the security uh, considerations, they will have ideas on what to say. If they have some particular uh, concept on how they want to work on this, because this, really, this is really node security, right? It's you store it, you do stuff, what do you have with it? It's not really the on the wire security, but they may have some new advice about that. And I see Steve uh, Crocker on the, uh, um uh, on the on the on the uh participations list do you have any other advice steve So, uh, not being Steve, um, yeah, I definitely encourage um, to to have um, some some requirements that that we found useful, even though they are not in the scope of the ITF. Um, because especially for, for I think the topic was the encrypted storage, um, because that's uh, somehow helpful to to define. I mean, that's part of the system, and the security requirements are also. Um, providing maybe some advices that are uh, how to integrate what the ITF is standardizing into um, an environment. So, yeah, I mean, I think I'm trying to answer uh, Amelia's uh, questions, which is, yeah, we don't have we don't need to be stuck to the ITF uh, specific um, environments, but we we can go a little bit above. This is Steve Crocker. I was on mute and had trouble uh, finding the right button to push. Uh, no, I don't have anything more to add. I've been out of the uh, active participation in the ITF security area for a very long time. So um, if I have something to say, I'll say it, but uh, you guys are proceeding quite well without me. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Daniel. Um, your earlier uh, work on on this type of concepts when we were working in other parts of the ITF group on on how to be careful on 
in in R2S on where we put data. That's that really brings to mind the the problem of of the encrypted storage. It's it's one that we've faced uh, multiple times over many decades, but at this point, I think it's actually a critical um, piece of the technical solution. And I'll just give you that as my opinion. Um, maybe there are people with more uh, security credentials than I have uh, that would consider uh, the pros and cons there. Thank you, Sue. Any other questions? Amelia, did we, do you get the response for, for your question? Yeah, yeah, sure, no, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comment? No, so I think we've reached the end of um, this meeting. Um, so has anyone to say uh, that might be a little bit out of scope of the draft um, that would fall in the any other business section? Hearing none, so if you're unmute, if you're if you're mute, please unmute your mic. Um, otherwise, I can declare the meeting adjourned. And thank you very much for your participation. We're waiting for your reviews. Um, I, I'm quite happy about how the work is being handled, um, and I'm I'm glad to see that moving on. Um, so we would like to keep the. The July deadline for the working group life school, uh, July is tomorrow. So, yeah, please get, um, um, yes, please, please get focused on that. And, um, and we'll try to make that happen. Um, I hope, uh, Adam, everything is going to be fine for you and your father. And um, I hope for that um, we'll meet each other in Madrid, virtually. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks a lot.